Hi friends, it's Monica and let's read House of Sky and Breath. I'm super excited to make this intro because um, House of Sky and Breath is one of my most anticipated reads of this year and I've been waiting like two years for this book to release and it's finally here. So I did get an exclusive edition from Indigo or Chapters and um, the bonus scene at the end of this book is about Bryce and Hunt. Okay, but for this video, it's going to be my first kind of, I guess, vlog style. But I'm sitting down and going through my reactions as I read the book. So I figured with reading this book, I did want to speak about the spoilers. So I will have an image of House and Sky and Breath in like a corner in this video when I'm speaking about spoilers because I won't be always holding up the book so I will have a little photo of the cover to let you know that there are spoilers being talked about but I also have timestamps in the description and in the comments below of when there are non-spoilers and when there are spoilers so this is the second book in the Crescent City series so there will be spoilers for the first book House of Earth and Blood because of course this is the second book so if you have not read the first book, uh, go read that book and then come back to this video. And I do recommend that if you have not finished House of Sky and Breath just yet, um, come back and watch the spoiler parts if you want to. And I will have another full in-depth review of House and Sky of Breath with spoilers and no spoilers sections of that video and that will be coming out within a day or two from this video and i'll have that linked up above so be sure to check that one out once it's uploaded so these are my initial reactions for the non-spoiler part i do have my copy of house of sky and breath here i usually do take off the dust jacket before i read it and i'm about 100 pages in and i think this is so yeah, I'm on chapter 9 if you could see that. And I'm using this really cute bookmark. It says hang out and read and it's like a little sloth. As soon as I started reading the second book, it was a lot different from the first book in terms of its pacing. Because in the first book, we were struggling to get through all the world building. And I recall a lot of people complaining about that, how the first 100 pages of House of Earth and Blood were incredibly slow but now that like the world has been established and going into this book we already know all the characters we already have a foundation so going into this book the pacing was a lot better right off the bat and myself i didn't even reread um house of earth and blood before even going into this book because the first book is also 800 pages long and i didn't want to reread it so i just read a recap online and even with me not rereading the first book, it was quite easy to get a hold of what's going on in the story. At this point in time in the book, we are still kind of gathering information of like what's going to be happening next to Bryce and Hunt and all their friends. In terms of Bryce and Hunt's relationship, it remains the same as how we left off with them. Like they're still in the will they won't they stage of their relationship. I guess friends with the benefits but I am looking forward to how they will evolve throughout this book. Another point for the beginning of the book was the prologue. So the prologue started off in a new location and that's all I'm gonna say about that but it was really interesting and it did remind me of like military action scenes. I'm not gonna say much about it but I really enjoyed it. <laughs> For all my non-spoilery people, I'm going to be saying spoilers now and I will have the little image of House of Sky and Breath on the screen now so you'd know when I stop talking about spoilers. Okay, so for the spoilers of this book so far, I really really thought at the house party at Rune's place that the person who was coming out of like the portal was going to be Edis. It ended up being Cormac, who is now a new character that we're being introduced to. He's the he's the crown prince of the Avalon Fae. I do think he will be a really significant character because, of course, having a random new character pop up does not mean they're just there for decoration, but I do think he has a really significant role to play. The chapter that I just ended off was just Cormac speaking on why he's even there in Crescent City and he's saying that he's in an arranged marriage with Bryce and I'm now thinking like is this guy gonna be another resend or 
another Rowan, but I still hunt in Rise or Endgame, but I let's see what happens from there. And going back to the beginning of the book with the prologue, now we have a new creature and that which is Sophie and Emil are both Thunderbirds. And of course, they will play a huge part in this book. And I think with that entire sequence of the prologue and getting into this book is about the human rebellion, even though that is what's hinted at in the synopsis of House of Sky and Breath, I did think the human rebellion aspect will be a huge next plot point in this book. And I think that'd be a really cool contrast to see like after Bryce and Hunt, they killed the previous archangels, Micah and Sandriel, and they weren't really the best leaders, but I guess it's going to be another form of rebellion maybe with Bryce and Hunt, but let's see. Oh yeah, one more other thing about the um, arranged marriage with Cormac and Bryce. I did like how Rune was kind of stepping up to his father and saying that, oh, this arranged marriage is really outdated and really not part of how things should be running now. I really did like how Sarah touched upon that aspect of the arranged marriage stuff and how fey females struggle to find their own place in this world. And I really think there will be more, more elaboration on that in the next chapters. So that's my initial thoughts right now. I'm really enjoying the book. Okay, so now I'm going to be talking about part one. So a lot went down since I last checked in with you guys and we are being introduced to a ton more people, a lot more characters, and kind of like a reintroduction of old characters that we haven't really had a focus on in the first book. We're seeing more of a certain werewolf as well as a certain mer or merman. I think they're they were referred to as Mer, M-E-R. So we have more of those characters coming into this book and they're quite involved in the mystery that's going on now. Okay, so what I was saying in the last clip, I believe, was how the pacing was a lot better than the first book. And the pacing is a lot better than the first book, but in part one, we're getting a lot of setup for this particular plot line that's being huge throughout this book. Part one, the pacing was a little bit slower, but I do think it will be paid off, but like I didn't not enjoy it. So I still enjoyed like the direction the book was going into. So we did get one steamy scene which, between Bryce and Hunt, which is obviously typical now of Sarah J Maas, so I'm not surprised at that. But I do still think they're going to be endgame. There were some revelations that I was pretty surprised at, but I think I was kind of just really focused on what was going on and not really predicting ahead of what will happen. And I think I missed that little tidbit, but um, that particular revelation I'm going to be talking about in the spoiler part was really shocking and I really liked that. And I was like, wait, it's... that's what happened? Okay, I'm going on to the spoiler part for part one. We are introduced to those different characters I am speaking about and it seems like each character has like their own particular mission and with Therion, the Mer man, um, he's part of the investigative work that's being done to, to find Julie and her brother Emil. I really enjoyed reading about the struggles of Therion and him being under the command of the River Queen and how he's kind of not all good with that just yet but he's just following orders. So let's just see how he fares in this book. Okay, and then we have the introduction of the Thunderbirds to the rest of the crew and seeing all their reactions were really nice. But like with that particular scene, I think it was like chapter 15 where it was revealed that Cormac was actually the agent or helped Emil escape on the boat back in the prologue, um, Agent Silverbow, Agent Silverbow. So Prince Cormac is actually Agent Silverbow and that really, that was the part that shocked me. And I think it would have been quite obvious if I was paying a little bit more attention. But the one thing about that scene was, it was kind of a massive info dump, which I did not like because it was like a huge revelation. Oh, okay, Therian's telling us all about this new mystery that we all need to solve and be aware of and of the human rebellion that's possibly really increasing in strength. And then now we have Prince Cormac coming out of that same situation and being 
oh, I'm tracking down Bryce because she has a connection to Sophie and, and Danica. It, it just seemed a little bit too convenient, but I guess it's the setup for this book. So I understand why that happened and how like Adas appeared in his cat form and was sleeping on Ethan's lap. <laughs> that part made me laugh. And um, I also like the different motivations that the crew had, the crew being like Bryce Hunt, Ethan, Rune, Adas, and Cormac, also Therian. Um, there are different motivations to pursue this investigation or to help this mission of Therian's. Therian and Cormac, of course, they're both under orders in a way, but Cormac has more personal connection to this case than Therian. It's more like the more experienced people being Hunt and Rune and like older Veneer um, that had experience with human rebels before in the war that preceded this book, how their side and their motivation to say, okay, no, we shouldn't be joining in into this search for Emil because then the Asteri and all the higher ups will then just execute us and kill us versus the less experienced people being that of Ethan, the werewolf who got kicked out of the pack because he helped out Bryce to save people during the demon attack on the city in the first book and we also have Bryce who's really headstrong and strong-willed and she will really really want to find out more answers about Danica because there also is a connection between Danica and Sophie so with that I understand why each person and everyone who's gathered in that room and gets the news basically there's a lot going on in part one we have the introduction of the Archangel Celestina. We also have the Human Rebellion and thing going on as well. That's an overarching plotline. And we also have more introductions of the Demon Princes. We have the Demon Prince of the Pit, Apollyon, um, contacting both Hunt and Bryce and basically threatening war. That was like the last page I just read before I picked up the camera. How the Reapers took Rune. So now Apollyon basically just wants to wage war against Bryce because it's like a second chance for him to defeat a Starborn. So I think that's going to be really entertaining. Anyways, on to part two and I'll see you guys soon. Okay, so I just made it to the end of part two in this book. So part two was called The Abyss and this entire section is around 250 pages so we have a lot to cover. And I decided to just do like end of the part reactions because I just felt like it would be more cohesive in that way of my reaction to House of Sky and Breath. So this entire part was about a whole lot of action. We have a whole lot of reveals as well of our characters. We also learn more about more details about some of the side characters. We are introduced in um, book one, but we also learn more about, of course, the characters that are more focused in this book. Me with Ethan, the wolf, and Therian, the mer. So we do learn a lot more about those two but in part two there are some unwanted guests that are arriving in crescent city our main crew really don't like considering the reveals are, are really pivotal to the storyline i really enjoyed part two the middle part compared to the introductory um, section of this book a lot more it felt a lot more better paced i think mainly because of the action sequences that took place and i would say this would be the accumulation of all the setup work that was happening in part one. The thing with Sarah J Mass's books, I do really love reading and imagining her action sequences. They're really cinematic that play out in my mind. And one particular action scene had me thinking about one movie character, or rather superhero character. And the writing makes it super easy to imagine what's happening in those really super intense moments and action sequences. So that's all I'm going to be saying for the non-spoiler parts for part two. So onto the spoilers of part two of House of Sky and Breath. So the first big thing that happened in part two was the huge battle in the Bone Quarter. This battle is between the Bone Quarter three-headed dog, I think it was called the Shepherd, versus Bryce and Hunt, who are trying not to obviously die. So this battle was really really fun to read and it really connected to Danica's email to Sophie about how they would be finding the place where weary souls rest. And going back to the movie that I thought of while reading this particular battle sequence, 
was Thor Ragnarok. And what brought that movie to mind was, of course, how Hunt in this battle scene has his lightning abilities. And I think at one point his eyes glow with like lightning and it reminded me of that imagery from the Thor movie with the battle against Hela. And if you haven't watched MCU movies, I really highly recommend them. They're really, really fun. But going back to this, and we also find out that Bryce and Hunt are not mates and they declare themselves as mates. With their relationship now at this point in the book, I was expecting that, like it wasn't a surprise to me. I was feeling like a lack of that ex spark of excitement of when like two characters get together. I don't know what it was like that was maybe lacking in this particular um, relationship, but I remember it in the first book, like there was a, so much tension and like the buildup was great. But then now in this book, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, we're, we're like friends, but like we're not going to declare what we are just yet because we're moving slow. But Bryce and Hunt are endgame, and I think Sarah did allude to that in like interviews and such. But um, with Bryce and Hunt, I do feel like their chemistry kind of fell flat in some parts in part one and part two. But I did really like during this battle scene how um, Bryce and Hunt had their powers work together and defeat the shepherd. In this series by Sarah that the mates are on a molecular level, you're bonded, your souls are bonded together. I just felt like it was so obvious, like, okay, yeah, their powers, of course, are gonna work. She, Bryce has power of blight, I think. <laughs> and then um, Hunt has the power of lightning. They have powers of light and energy, so like, oh, like they will work together well. I guess the most major thing that also came out of that bone quarter scene was that they find out the souls that are supposed to go to a really peaceful and restful place after you pass away. But then our main pair, they find out that that's not the case and the souls are being regenerated or being reused as second light for it to like basically power the city. And that's really morbid. I feel bad for our characters who have to kind of figure out what is going on on that side of the problem. We also have the arrival of some unsavory characters to the city, including the Hind, um, Pollux, Baxian, basically of the Triari of Sandriol and how they are now sent to Crescent City to become part of the new Archangels Triari. And these new characters that are now in the city are the rivals of Hunt and our crew. It was nice to learn about those characters as well, but then again, I didn't really feel much of a threat against them, if that makes sense. Like, like Sarah was just telling us, oh, oh, this is what they did in the past, and this is, they're just horrible people. So just accept it. I guess, like, again, there was like a bit of lacklusterness in their villain arcs, I would say. Even their horrible actions that are shown in the in this particular part, it wasn't really directly f affecting our characters. It was just like, okay, they are affecting people around our main characters. And I felt that just brought a lack of evilness to these bad characters. Anyways, I digress, so moving on to my next point. Further in, into part two, like near the end of part two, I'd say that this is when our crew was like knee deep into the rebellion cause and helping out the rebels. And we have our second battle in this part, which takes place on the island of Hydra. I think that's what it's pronounced. And basically now our crew of Hunt, Bryce, Therian, Ethan, and Rune, they're trying to destroy this new prototype of the mech suit. That battle was also really fun to read about, but also at the same time, um, our crew is at a severe disadvantage. People get injured and stuff. And the thing about that scene, I guess, just stuck out to me. That was the technology use and how I'm not used to reading so many urban fantasies. I did like the battle scene and the world that Sarah has created in this book, but I just feel like that my immersion is a bit disconnected <laughs> because I'm used to reading fantasies that take place in non-technological worlds. In part two, I thought the technology bits of this world were taken away from the plot in terms of like my enjoyability of reading this book. So I think that's why it's taken me some time to read this book. 
now filming this part like after taking like two or three days from not reading at all because I think I was just like, okay, part one was really nice, but then... And basically my point is being that I just wanted uniqueness to like this world, I guess, because it, it just feels like it's modern day of like everything that we already know of in our world on Earth. It's just mythical creatures that are being placed in front of us. And we also find out a huge confirmation in this part that Sophie is actually dead. I felt really bad for Cormac in that part because they were uh, lovers. I'm really interested to see how Sarah will end this book. I'll be coming back with my reaction to part three and I'll be concluding off this video. So we're at the end of the book now and I'm gonna be talking about part three of this book. And part three is called The Pit. And within this last part of the book it was so intense so from following from part two part three is such as a whole different ball game compared to part two in terms of witnessing different relationships develop and how certain events put strain on certain relationships and that was really intense to read about emotionally wise we also learn about some secrets and there are some great reveals at the end of this book i did feel like um part three was relatively easy to read through compared to part one which i had some issues if you had watched that part since then the pacing has improved and continuing on from the middle section of the book towards the end and to the explosive finale it was a quite satisfying read while like this is the non-spoiler section for part three it's a little bit hard for me to not say any spoilers from this point on so i'll be going more in depth in my in-depth discussion video that will be uploaded soon. And the best thing about this third section were the big twists and reveals that we get and also well as that ending, which was awesome. <laughs> okay, now going on to some spoilers in this section. Uh, we do have some trust issues. That's what I'm calling them as for Bryson Hunt in the beginning of part three because Bryce has just revealed that she already had planned out where Emil would be staying and that would be at the Viper Queen's um, place. With that, Bryce was hiding some plans from Hunt and that reminded me of Aelin and Selena of how in the Throne of Glass series, she would always be hiding her plans from her friends. I get why Hunt was upset at Bryce for hiding that from him because Hunt thinks that they are a team and they should be talking through everything together but then again they've only known each other for a couple months at this point and he was also quite worried for Bryce because they're in a rebellion situation and he knows how dangerous that can be but Hunt does come around and realizes that Bryce is really considerate to Emil and for his well-being especially when uh, Emil isn't a thunderbird himself and he's just a regular human and talking about Bryce and Hunt they did have some quite um, emotional and vulnerable scenes especially the one at the archives it was really heartwarming and I really like seeing that emotional side to them and I felt like I was missing that throughout part one and two I guess like the chemistry that they had in book one didn't translate as strongly into book two in the beginning portion and i think the stakes weren't as high in the beginning of house and sky and breath compared to the end i did feel more of that emotional vulnerability that these two go through and it was so and it was so like addicting to read about so we also have some demon activity happening at the northern rift in crescent city and I did expect for a demon attack to happen, which did happen. <laughs> With Bryce and Hypaxia, they fight off these demons. And that's the moment where Bryce finally officially learns how to use her teleportation ability. And personally, I really, really love teleportation magical abilities in fantasy books. It's just like a unique ability, I think, to have. And we also find out that Bryce is officially declared as a princess of the Fae by her father because she was using her royal name to help out Juniper with like the dance director situation as well as like getting access to speak to the governor or Archangel Celestina. So she was using her royal name and 
now she has to face the consequences of actually being a fae princess and the drama from that was really fun to read about because then we have Hunt's reaction to finding out that now he's also a prince of the fae because they're mates and again there was a vulnerable scene between Bryce and Hunt which I did appreciate regarding this uh, situation with the fae princess and prince titles and from that we also have Rune who's pretty much advocating towards um, Bryce to take up the Fae throne as queen instead of him because he doesn't think he will be fit for the throne and I thought that was really sweet of him and their sibling relationship was one that I always look forward to read about and the next big scene was like the masquerade ball so Bryce and Hunt they officially declare themselves as mates in public in front of the archangels all the high society members that they are officially together um, Bryce's father is not happy about that and I do really enjoy this side of Bryce being like brash and not following the standard rules especially when in her face side of herself that their culture is quite strict for uh, females and women to not even have a say in who they marry and such. We also get some few romantic reveals here with Celestina and Hypaxia being lovers and that did bring a lot of contention I think in the future scenes and we did find out that Celestina was telling and reporting to the Asteri about Hunt and Bryce and how they were lying about certain things. So um, this part did hint at Celestina's future betrayal as well as Celestina being like, oh, I don't even want to be in love because it risks so much for me. And another part at this masquerade ball was with Rune and Daybright. They were supposed to meet up at midnight near like a fountain or something. And the reveal of who they Agent Daybright actually is. That was shocking to me, but I'll get to that in a bit. I always just love having a ball where huge things go down and it's always entertaining to read about. From this point on, we're now moving towards more secrets being revealed and one being at the Erd's temple. So we have our crew uh, who are battling against the rebels that are now infiltrating this Erd's temple after the under king basically tipped off the rebels. So who was at the temple were Bryce, Hunt, Rune, and Hypaxia. And basically now Bryce and Hunt are stuck there. But then, oh my gosh, we have Baxian who comes and saves them and leads them out a secret exit. It is then revealed that Baxian is actually Danica's mate. And I was not expecting this part at all. And when he showed like the tattoo of um, through love all is possible in Danica's handwriting, Bryce was like, what the hell? This isn't real. Who are you? <laughs> and I thought that part was really, again, shocking. And we also received some information about how Baxine and Danica met and how they are linked to Sophie. And also the there was like a, a code that Sophie like drew carved into herself while she was drowning of like letters and numbers and it came from Baxian. And at first I only thought that Baxian only wanted to join the crew because he wanted to turn a new leaf but like of course like it would not make much sense if he didn't have an actual personal reason to be pursuing to join our crew of characters. So finding out that he was Danica's main it did bring a lot of depth to this to his character but after um, Bryce finds out about Danica and Sophie both going to the Asteri archives. Of course, that's where she wants to go next and that's where a whole lot of shit goes down. <laughs> we find out a bunch of things about the Asteri and Midgard and what the truths of this world are and what Danica was even researching for in the first place and basically what Danica and Sophie died for. So what we do find out about the Asteri are that they're powerful beings that are thousands to tens tens of thousands of years old who has destroyed the world for food and their food source being that of first light so that's what feeds into their power and essentially makes them truly immortal and they've been stuck in Midgard for around 15,000 years and they have lured other species from different worlds who they thought they were conquering another world but they were actually being lured into Midgard as a trap for the Asteri and become their never-ending 
food source <laughs> as well as um, the steri would pit the species against each other so they would be distracted. There are also mentions of the demon princes from hell. 15,000 years ago had the steri infiltrate hell, their world, but they weren't tricked into the Asteri being nice and all but so hell and the demon princes they went to war against the Asteri and the Asteri managed to defeat them and sealed off their world but also hell and the demon princes did side with the Midgard citizens who were against the Asteri so that would include Prince Ada's and um, Thea who was the first starborn princess so they both paired up and were fighting against the Asteri and trying to protect the innocents. So Hal did manage to successfully close the gate, which is the portal to different worlds, and trap the Asteri in Midgard for 15,000 years. But now that Bryce and all of our characters are coming together and finding out the truth. The Asteri want Bryce to use the horn, the magical fey horn that she has tattooed on her back, to open up the portals again to the different worlds so they could the exact revenge on people and get more magical food from themselves. Like in this book, there was a lot of themes of the Asteri being the like overlords and people feeling oppressed under them, that they had no true freedom and that things in this world weren't as what they seem. So I did had a little bit of an inkling of like the Asteri are not who they say they are and how the veneer, the magical creatures in this world are not originally from Midgard. But like re just reading through um, those chapters really, I was like what is going on in this world? It's crazy. And that really did bring up my mood for this book to keep on reading. After Bryce finds out this huge reveal of who the Asteri actually are and she's of course disgusted and she wants to teleport back to Hunt because they are separated at this point. But once Bryce is back to Hunt, he's clean cuffs already. So we have um, Bryce, Hunt, and Rune in the palace dungeons and we have the Harpy and Pollux there. Those two are like torturers and the Harpy wants to torture Rune first before the hind comes. The huge twist here is the hind stops the harpy and kills the harpy from um, touching Rune and it's revealed that she's actually Agent Daybright and she's a double agent for the rebels and the Asteri. I didn't mention too much of Agent Daybright or Day and Rune earlier but this reveal to their arc was really shocking to me as well and I was like okay I did not expect that to happen that Lydia, she has so many different titles or different names that Lydia was actually the person that Rune was like falling in love with. <laughs> and already Lydia and Rune reminds me of Danica and Baxian because of them being enemies towards each other and how they can move past that. So then our trio of prisoners are escorted to the throne room and there is the Asteri Regulus. This Asteri, he's explaining that he orchestrated all the plans to bring Bryce and Hunt to the um, Asteri Palace. I was kind of disappointed at that news because um, when Adas in his cat form was in Bryce's apartment and he was like revealing all the secrets and whatever he wants them to do next and work with the rebels. I was disappointed in that because I wanted to have more real Ada's interactions with our characters. But Bryce does successfully manage to escape the palace through the portal gate that's in the palace and away from Regulus. And the only thing is she doesn't end up in hell. She ends up in Perinthian of our Akatar world where the inner circle then greets her. <laughs> And this is the part where I was like, what the hell just happened? Sarah's making like her own universe with all her series. Because in the last book of Throne of Glass, this is a massive spoiler for that book, for Kingdom of Ash, Aelin does fall through different worlds and she sees Feyre who's being, who's pregnant at the time and as well as she, she falls through the world of Crescent City. So now we have an actual character being in another book series world and I was, I'm so happy about that because it's just going to be so like spicy to read about. 
and I, I like literally screamed internally when I was reading the last chapter of where Azrael finds Bryce and he's like speaking in a language that she doesn't understand oh gosh I feel so bad for Bryce um because now she's separated literally worlds away from Midgard and now she's in Corinthian she she doesn't even know what's gonna happen she's trying to probably get back to Midgard and find out and rescue Hunt oh yeah with Hunt so the rest of the crew that um, helped to infiltrate the Asteri archives here is the list that I have written Cormac's dead <laughs> Theory I managed to get free Bryce is in Perinthian Hunt and Baxian are given the like the thorn slave tattoos again oh my gosh that scene was so sad to read about and I don't know if Rune will also have that mark on him, but um, maybe he will. But Rune's also being captured by the Asteri and possibly being... They're all gonna get tortured, like ugh. So sad. For my predictions and like my full, full thoughts and everything, like right now I'm just like rambling about what happened. But man, this last part of this book was so good. It was so intense and... I literally could not put the book down until I finished it. So with our poor characters, I can't wait to see what happens to them. And I did hear that um, Sarah was going to be writing Crescent City book three first before Akatar book five. And that like um, CC3 would be released before Akatar book five. So. Oh gosh, I don't know. I mean, there's so many, there's so much crossover that's gonna be happening now, and I don't know what to expect. I will put some predictions up in my full in-depth discussion slash review video that's going to be coming up. But with that being said, I did end up reading House of Sky and Breath, a 4.5 out of 5 stars, because there were some issues that I had in the first part of the book that I just can't overlook. <laughs> Um, I, I'm being a little bit more critical this year, I think. But overall, House and Sky and Breath continue to be an excellent adult over in fantasy book to read that delivers on action, romance, and fighting for what's right. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this vlog style kind of sit down review reaction while I'm reading. <laughs> and remember to tune in for my full in-depth discussion of this book that will be uploaded very, very soon. Don't forget to give me a big thumbs up, hit that subscribe button down below, and ring that notification bell to not miss any future uploads. I'll see you all soon.